Uh oh. <laughs> All right, man. I'm going to put you on mute for just a second. Welcome to Underground Opolis, everybody. Thank you for watching. And uh, got some very, got a very important special guest, is Mr. Frank Sesich. He's done some incredible things. I can't believe that he actually said, Yeah, sure, I'll be on the show. <laughs> You like that intro song, Eddie? <laughs> Frank has played with Blue Ash, which is considered by many the very first power pop band. Um, that's what you just... No, you heard of Stim Baders. You heard Stim, the Disconnect song, which is another great song. And uh, I've got a huge announcement to make. We we here at Underground Opolis have just inked a deal with Splatter Tribe Radio, and it's going to be on Splatter Tribe Radio um, I think the official, official launch date for radio, for the radio station itself is is March 9th. Underground Opolis will be on on there Thursday nights at 7 p.m. on starting March 10th. I'm very excited to announce that. I was that's so great, and we're just going to go ahead and bring Frank on. What's up, Hello. Frank? How you doing, Rob? <laughs> All right. Well. I forgot to mention that he does have a book out. <laughs> he has it here too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having, I'm really having fun with the stories too, man. I, I like, the, I like the Elvin uh, Dabney. Dabney. Yeah, is Frank, that it? Frank, yeah, that's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're probably all true. Yeah, they mostly are. Are really? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, Elvin was, was a real guy. He was a friend of mine. We used to walk to school in the mornings. We'd be in ninth grade. And he'd say how old it was. And it was screwed up doing all this. We should just quit school and join up with his cousin, Alvin in Akron, who was a professional thief. He's never been caught. He's got all this money, steals cars, got all these good looking women. He'd always regale me with stories of Alvin. So I, that just stuck in my mind. I, I write a lot of uh, songs from characters i grew up with and about people i grew up with so i came up with that song and they still play it on uh, little steven's underground garage which is kind of cool it's one of the ones they play on the channel 23 alvin dabney professional thief so it's one of my best <laughs> i like that song a lot I do. Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that it's on little steven's is, <laughs> which is kind of who i yeah. emulated this show yeah. after a little a little bit huh yeah, he liked it quite a bit when that album came out in 2010. So he, he they play it. It's on regular rotation. Plays every couple of days on the Channel 23 uh, Underground Garage 25. It is rather 21 Channel 21 Sirius Radio. But yeah, it's a lot of fun to hear that on the radio. <laughs> yeah. So if if uh if there was a person that you could say, I saw I saw this guy playing on a stage or whatever. It, that said, I want to do that. Could you narrow that down? Is, that, oh, is there absolutely. somebody? Yeah, the first concert I ever saw in my life, Rob, was um, Bob Dylan at Cleveland Music Hall in 1965. It was on his first electric tour with the band. And I was 14 years old. My sister was going uh, to school in Cleveland and got me a ticket for it. And it was the first concert I ever saw and the greatest concert I've seen till this day. It's when Highway 61 Revisited album was out. And he did all an acoustic set first, then got on the piano and played uh, Ballad of a Thin Man and uh, um, Positively Fourth Street, then did a whole electric set. I went home that weekend, and that's what I wanted to do. You know, I, I, I've got to be a musician. I've got to do that. <laughs> it was still the best concert I've seen to this day, and I've seen everybody, but that was it. <laughs> well. Do you have a creative process that you use or is it just the, the typical it comes? I got to pull over. I got to write this down before I forget it because that's what I got to do. When I write. Yeah, what I usually do, sometimes I start with the music first, but usually I start with a title. If I get a great title that I think is interesting, like Johnny Sincere or Alvin Dabney, The Green Man, um, any of the ones I've written like that, Circumstantial Evidence. I can usually go with it from there, get the lyrics and, and, and the music. But sometimes I get the music first, then I'll go through my old list of titles. What I do now in the computer age is if I get a good title, I'll write it in a, a draft to a letter to myself, an email, and then I'll start putting lyrics on it. So I've got like these hundreds of things addressed to myself on drafts on my 
a Yahoo email. And then if I need something, I'll go out and pick it up. I've, I've started a new one right now called uh, um, Tinfoil Hats is, is my uh, thing. And it's, it's kind of a, a political uh, songs. I don't write too many of those, but it's got a great melody and a great open G tuning. So that's what I'm working on now. But I'll go back to my library of, of lyrics and phrases. Like you said, you would pull over. I used to have notebooks and pull over. Stib did the same thing. He'd always write things in a notebook. But now I just go right on the computer and type a letter to myself. I'll play for new new song, so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. Here's some lyrics that rhyme, and I'll just go with that. And if I need something, I'll pull it out like that. How did uh, how did Blue Ash come together? Um, Jim Kenzer and I uh, started playing when we were in, in ninth grade in 1966. We had a group called the City Jail, and we were together for a year or so. And then um, I started playing the Mother Goose Band and everything. And when I left the Mother Goose Band in 69, I, I was trying to get Jim into the Mother Goose Band, but they didn't like him for some reason. He's one of the greatest singers in the world. I think they were just jealous of him. But anyway, um, we, we decided we were going to uh, have a, a, a new band and do mostly originals. So um, in that summer uh, of 69, we uh, started the band Blue Ash and decided to take a trip to Nashville. To, um, we were only 17 years old and to, to get some ideas. And we were naming, trying to name the band all the way down there uh, on the highway on Interstate 71. We we're coming up with all these goofy names. And I said, that's it. We're just going to name the band after the next sign we see. And Jim goes, Blue Ash. It's right outside of Cincinnati on 71. So that's how we got the name. That's how the band started. And that was uh, Jim Kinzer yourself. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Bill Yendrick and David Evans, who became the, was the drummer of Blue Ash. Uh, Yendrick quit the band after a year and we got Bill Bartle and he became my singing my songwriting partner and that's when blue ash really started taking off and we were playing 200 250 days a year and um uh made some demo tapes in 72 and, and youngstown sent them out and, and luckily enough four labels wanted to sign us uh polydor mgm metro media and mercury and paul nelson came down from mercury and loved the band and and signed us up he signed the new york dolls at the same time so our albums came oh. up with a few months of each other signed by the same guy yeah it's tougher than that now in a way it's like they, they always want you to pay them <laughs> yeah yeah well it was tough back then though too because there were a million bands as well you know so it, i mean if you got on a major label it was probably the equivalent of getting on a major league baseball team and you became a star maybe or you didn't you went back down to the minors which kind of happened to us but uh at least we had a good cult following in the nice and and a lot of people still remember the band still buy it and they still put out blue ash albums all over the world in spain and countries so which we toured over yeah, there you... in 2016 too and that was a lot of fun wow yeah, yeah you played all over the world haven't you You've, oh like, yeah i've been everywhere japan everywhere not not yet. i just i just finished uh right before i got on here tonight i finished an interview in a magazine in japan and i'm going to try to work on something to go over there but now i played in england scotland uh, uh spain czech republic uh, germany denmark sweden all over canada all over the place i yeah. i really thought i thought you'd been japan i apologize my bad <laughs> i thought you were gonna, oh which is cool no. it's awesome <laughs> And a lot of fans there, but I got to work out something to go to go there. Uh, Blue Ash and Deadbeat Poets both have um, new albums coming out in um, the end of 2021. We're done, pretty much done with the Deadbeat Poets. We have to add about three more songs for Blue Ash. It'll be the first new Blue Ash stuff in like 40 years. So oh, yeah. I've got a lot of people interested in putting it out. I'll, I'll make a deal pretty soon. And with that I, i'll do something i'll try to i'll get us over to japan i think we would go over there well and i've got a lot of connections oh i think so too See, absolutely I, yeah well when did you first meet stiv stiv baders I, I met stiv in 1967 i was 16 years old and um uh i met him and jeff jones who became 
Blue Ashes manager right around the same time. He would go to a lot of the um, you know, teen dances in Youngstown. We were always over there a lot, the carousel teen clubs and places like that. So I got to know him at those places. I actually met him at the university there at this like hippie house he was at. And uh, we became fast friends and, and stuff like that. Once Blue Ash started going to 69, um, we would um, uh, always have his, he was in Mother Goose Band then had them open up for us a lot, a lot of the time. So like when we did Tommy or we played many pop festivals around here. And I was the first guy that brought him on stage in like uh, 69 in the summertime at a small pop festival, the pickup band. With, uh, me and Myron Grumbacher, from, who later played in Pat Benatar as a drummer, uh, Steve Acker, and uh, and Stiv. And I brought Stiv on, and he said he was a harmonica player, but he didn't have a harmonica. He would just cup his hand and whoo, 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 make harmonica sounds. But it was amazing. It was like a harmonica. Uh, so he got up, he played the harmonica on some stone stuff and, and, and things like that, Stooges. And he took out a um, a can of whipped cream and started shaking it like in his crotch area. And I thought, oh, boy, this guy's nuts, you know. So he's shooting it all over the audience. He threw a mic stand up, came down, clicked him in the head, cut his head open. People went nuts over him. And that's when he started, you know, got in the Mother Goose band right after that and started his career. But that was his first real professional engagement. I brought him up as a pickup band in uh, Canfield, Ohio. He talks about it in a couple interviews. If you ever see some old ones, he'll talk about that going up there on stage. That time. I had ended up taking him to the hospital to get stitched up from uh, the stitches. He needed like 10 stitches in his head. <laughs> but that's how he started. I, w- I would take 10 stitches for that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. But I would. And, you know, at that age, he was, he's two years older than me. So he was a little bit older than me. So yeah, I was kind of a, yeah, I was already in bands and stuff, but he wasn't, but yeah, we hung out a lot back then. Uh, we, we discussed last night about Stiv's, you know, cause I'm here in Louisville or Louisville area. I'm actually on the Indiana side, <laughs> but still I'm in Louisville. <laughs> You know, I'm 13 minutes from downtown, which is irrelevant. But <laughs> um, free you said they got you, huh? I, I, I can't hear you there. So you're right across you, the river in, in Indiana. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Just I'm, I'm 13 yeah, minutes from of- downtown. We oh, got that's you. Not bad. Yeah. I like, but, I like playing. I was there and played the knock bar and at uh, Brett Ralph's uh, record store, Surface Noise, which is a great place. Had a nice little concert there in the afternoon. Fun place. I know. I had to work that night. Ugh, stupid job. Oh. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, I remember. I, will we get to a sense of normalcy, I guess? You're going to come back? I definitely will. Yeah. Hopefully things will open up by the end of the summer. It looks like everybody's going to get vaccinated by the end of uh, May now. They're announcing today. So maybe things will open by the end of the summer, fall time. So that'd be cool. I'd love to. I miss going on the road. I went there with Ghetto Blasters, great band from uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and toured down there with them. And then in the east in the later months of um, uh, 2019, New York and Baltimore, Philly and all that. So I'll definitely come back to Louisville. I got a great Mexican restaurant right down from uh, uh, Surface Noise here. <laughs> <laughs> Probably La Bombas. <laughs> Burritos as big as your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but you you, you mentioned that Stibbs, Stibbs said he liked to play Louisville. Uh, I just kind of wanted you to share that story that you shared with me last night because I thought it was funny. <laughs> I played at Surface Noise. They they asked me. They said Stib always said that one of the, his favorite places to play was Louisville. And they had talked to one of the other Dead Boys, and they said, "Well, the Dead Boys never played Louisville, and they couldn't figure it out." And I started laughing. They said, "We've this always been something we've tried to figure out here." And I said, "It happened because he would play there in Mother Goose Band, not in in uh, the Dead Boys." 
because the, <laughs> one of their managers was from Louisville. The move up here. So I, I put all the, the mystery uh, Louisville Stiv favorite place to play in order there. So that's how that happened. It was from Mother Goose then, which would have been pre-Frankenstein, pre-Dead Voice. Real early 70s, 1977. So how did uh, you did you did like catch the what last little bit of Dead Boys that you was a part of that or? Yeah. In in um, 1979, Steve and I went to California and we recorded for Greg Shaw and everything records coming out and they were doing some Dead Boys reunions and. In the fall, they had um, a gigs booked all over the East Coast and Toronto for the, which was the, the DOA movie about the Sex Pistols, and the Dead Boys ran. And Dib called me up the night before. He goes, "Jeff Magnum doesn't want to do it. You want to play these gigs?" I said, "Yeah." Well, anyway, I ended up playing with another year and a half with them on the road in various lineups. First, it was all the original Dead Boys, uh, Cheetah, Blitz, uh, Zero, and Baders, and then me. Then one by one, Cheetah broke his wrist. So we got George Cabinets, and then Jimmy and Blitz still stayed. And after about a year, Blitz was gone, and David Quentin Steinberg. So it morphed into the Disconnected Band. And the last tour we did was the Disconnected Band, and then with Brian James from um, Lords of the New Church. And that was December of 1980 and 1981. And I played with him through that time at all the gigs then. So I was with him oh. a good year and a half. Probably played 100, 100. Do, do you have a favorite show you've done? Uh, yeah, I, I have quite a few, actually. Um, my, one of my favorites with Blue Ash was um, we opened for the Stooges February 9th, uh, 1974. It's when the Metallic KO concert was um, done in, in, in Detroit. It was their last gig they did for another 20 the crazy one with uh, playing Louie Louie and that that was one of my favorites and that was uh, February 9th 1974 uh, playing with the Dead Boys with John Belushi uh, at um, um, uh, the Whiskey at Go-Go was amazing and uh, playing with Blue Ash a few jobs we did with Raspberries uh, Packard Music Hall a lot of Blue Ash jobs the one we did where Stiv opened up for us in 1970 was the um, uh, we did all of Tommy from The Who. And that was a tremendous gig. There's so many of them. I, I think Blue Ash has played over, I think, 1,600 gigs, and we did that in about eight years. So that was like averaging 200 a year. And then, like, yeah. like I said, I did 100, 100 with Stiv uh, gigs. Uh, and then I'm, I was in a band called Bob Wow with uh, Jimmy Zero and played for three years. And then the Deadbeat Poets I've been in since 2006. For 15 years now, we've had nine albums out and played all over Europe and all over the world. So, I've I've been around. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, here's the counter question: Do you have a least favorite show? <laughs> uh no, I, I, I actually, but it's it's a funny one. It, it's not least. We, when Blue Ash was on tour, we played um, Cody, the Lost Airman. And we had to open up, and it was all these redneck, drunken hillbillies. And it was they were no mood for the Blue Ash Power Pop, you know. And they started throwing beer bottles at us. And it was the first time that had ever happened. So a couple of them hit, and Jim Kendra did one of the greatest things in the world. He grabbed one of the beer bottles in midair and threw it right back into the crowd. And, I mean, there were a 1,000 people at a huge pub. And he goes, any more come up on stage? They're coming right back at you. And then it stopped, and they started liking us. But that was the only time we ever got booed or had stuff thrown at us. Because we were usually a pretty good live band and could win anybody over. But that was the one that was the craziest. <laughs> Commander <laughs> Cody and the Lost one. With their hot rod link. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. Who, do you have a musician you most admire? I must admire. Uh, yeah, I really like. It's hard really to narrow like down. Jeff Beck a lot, guitar player, and I and Steve and I actually became friends with him out in L.A. and I'd met him in London and stuff too. He's a great guy. Uh, I I like so many guys from the 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 punk era and the power pop guys. We were friends with the Ramones and the Records. 
It's uh, Flame and Groovy's great band, uh, Chris Wilson. Um, a lot, a lot of bands like that. I, I, I got to meet and uh, just just had a great, great time hanging out with them. Yeah. Uh, I want you to got to meet just the Stones, so that was pretty cool. Of course, I admire them. I, did. I want, I want you to share any favorite story with with the we, we we've got a we've got an audience, so <laughs> you can't see it, but I can. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well. When when we were when I was playing with with Stib in um, December of nineteen um, seventy nine, we, we were doing a lot of gigs around Philadelphia, um, New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, and we played about three weeks worth of gigs, and we had a couple nights off. And uh, a lot of people used to come to hang out. Uh, Nico, uh, Anita Pallenberg would always come there, and she says one time, and she was a big fan of that. She goes, "Keith's having a birthday party." Keith Richards and you guys are going to be invited. Well, I'll tell you where it's at like the night before. So she calls up and she says, we have this Roxy, Roxy roller disco in New York. So uh, Zero Baders and I get in the cab and go over there and, and Anita meets us at the uh, uh, at the door. And as soon as we walk in, uh, Keith Richards and Ron Wood were there. And Keith was real cool and he's it's cool. You know, it, everything you've ever heard about, it, he's that cool in person too. And he goes, your cheetah did it. Your cheetah did it. Going, what did he do? He goes, he was on roller skates and fell and broke his wrist. He goes, my driver took him to the hospital. I go, we go, oh, man, that's what, you know, we had to get another uh, guitar fix. We had all these gigs lined up. Anyway, so we're there and he's, you know, made sure to have all these beers and everything. And we're drinking all this stuff and having a good time. There's all kinds of people and a lot of famous people. And Mick Jagger was there and he was on roller skates and he had a big beard. And he's drinking a Michelob beer. I, I swear to God, Michelob. <laughs> and so during, during he's talking to a couple of Jamaican guys. And during, during the party, I see Stiv's moving over toward me. I told Nudge Zero, I go, we better go with him. He's going to do something. So he taps Jagger on the shoulder. And we hadn't met Mick, you know. And he turns around with the most condescending look I've ever seen. And Stiv wasn't very tall, about five, six or so. And Jagger on skates was like six foot four. He looks down and gives him... The most condescending look I've ever seen in my life. And Steve goes, where's the men's room at? <laughs> Jack goes, what? He goes, I said, he goes, where's the men's room at? And he goes, oh, it's up there around the corner. You know? So we go in the men's room. We're just dying laughing, falling the bikes. I can't believe you did that to Mick Jagger. <laughs> yeah. And Mick was always his hero, but he had to do something. you know. So we had a great night time at that party. and was a lot of fun. That was one of the highlights of playing with them too that night you know so it was pretty cool and i guess that's night that's night was uh when keith actually met patty hansen who he ended up marrying at that party that night i've read later on so that's pretty pretty cool a pretty fun time that night that's that's great <laughs> <laughs> i know you got more i know you got more <laughs> yeah well but but what i was telling you we played at the whiskey this would have been well, go go, January twenty fifth, twenty sixth, and twenty seventh of nineteen eighty, and we went out there and sold out. It was a long weekend: Friday, Saturday, Sunday, two shows a night. We sold out all six shows. On the first night, uh, we got an encore, and John Belushi had been backstage, and he was uh, 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 hanging out with us and, and partying and everything. And he wanted to come out and play a, a, a Sonic producer. So we get an encore after we're done rousing crowd. Everything's going real good. And Stips goes, there's just some guy backstage. He's wanting to come up and play drums. We're going to let him come up, you know. So Belushi comes up and he gets on the drum riser. And people started gradually realizing who it was. He didn't introduce me. He, you know, takes a bond. They're cheering. And all of a sudden, the, the, the roar was deafening. Because at that time, it was just after Animal House and and Blues Brothers, and, and of course, uh, Saturday Night Live. He was one of the biggest stars in the world. So we got to play Sonic Producer and just go crazy, and everybody's going nuts. And um, are you allowed to swear on here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right, anyways, so uh, after it's done, John jumps off the horizon. and we're just going absolutely crazy. And he walks right up to me, and he yells in my ear. He goes, did I fuck up? And I go, no, you sounded great. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and he takes a bow to the crowd. So we went 
went upstairs and party um, a little bit more. And then John went next door uh, uh, to the, uh, um, oh, what was it, next to Roxy, one of the clubs he was there. And Muddy Waters was playing, and he played drums with Muddy Waters. And I was talking to Jimmy Zero about a month ago. I go, why didn't we ever go with him over to the, the, the Muddy Waters show? We couldn't believe we didn't go that night. But he was, he was a cool guy. And then the next thing we know, they took a, there were pictures taken of Donna Santisi, took some great pictures, and it ended up in a big spread in People magazine. So there we were, the, the, you know, the dead boys of John Belushi in, in the uh, 25 million dentist office you know, in People magazine. So it was pretty cool at the time. That's one of my highlights of playing there. Do you have a favorite Blue Ash song you play? A particular favorite? Oh, I, there's so many of them. When we played in Spain, it was great because, um, like, Abracadabra, have you seen her? Uh, that's one of my favorites. Uh, Bill Bartlett and I wrote that, and that was the first single on Mercury Records. And the records from England did a, a cover of that, and it came as a bonus EP with their first album. That's one of my favorite, but we would do that or playing to see, uh, sm smash my guitar. Um, I remember a time we would do that in Spain and you'd look out hundreds of Spanish people singing along. That. And it was really, really cool. You know, you could actually hear it just coming back at you. But uh, yeah, and it's kind of cool because we're doing a new Blue Ash album. Now we've got eight songs done already. It's me and Jim Kenzer and Bill Bartlett, our guitar player, passed away in 2009 he had cancer but um the be poets are on, on it too john lumick john Corey, and peter bear we've been doing it at amp Round recorder and uh, we've got eight songs then we got to do about another three uh, a lot of new originals that jim and i have written and, and i think it's our best work yet and i think people are gonna be real surprised when they hear it it's a lot of fun so hopefully we can do a couple more tours and it'll be a nice legacy for blue ash and new debbie poets coming out too so a lot of stuff will be coming out by the end of the year. What would be your favorite uh, the, off the Disconnected album? What would you think, think would be your favorite? Uh, Million Miles favorite one. And they use that in Danny Garcia's um, uh, Stiv, you know, Compromise. And I forget where I met you at, at the premiere in Cleveland. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and it, it, it's that, that was one of my favorites. And that's the one they did in the movie where it starts when we went to Los Angeles and everything. And that was one of Stibb's favorites, too. And uh, Mike Monroe recorded that. And a lot of people have done it. And we've even done it on, on the new Blue Ash album because it was originally a Blue Ash song, but we had never, ever done it except as an acoustic demo. We never recorded it anywhere. So Jim Kenzer and I have recorded it this time, too. So it's, it'll be part of that album as well. That's, that's some news. For I like everybody. that song. We did that. <laughs> Yeah, it's not really, really good. Yeah. All right. Favorite Deadbeat, Deadbeat Poet song right now? Oh, uh, Deadbeat Poet is, is mine is Jenny Berg Hill. And like I said, I, I write a lot of uh, songs about, uh, you know, uh, going up here in Sharon, PA. And that's an actual place here, part of the town. And it's got a real personal thing for me. So I like that a lot. I love the Stiv Bader's Ghost Tour. That was also used in, in the film done by Room Full of Strangers and by myself in Danny's film, Stiv, No Compromise, No Regrets. Um, I had quit the music business in 1990 after uh, after Bader's had, had, had died. And um, uh, I just, you know, uh, quit. I, I walked away. I got a, jo a job with an insurance company. I never even picked up a guitar for 13 years. And uh, one day in 2003, I picked up my old 1966 guitar with 13-year-old strings on it and played that riff to the Stiv Bader Scout for And I thought to myself, ah, oh, shit, I've got to write this damn thing. Now, I hadn't written a song in 13 years. So I wrote that and then Jenny Burke Hill and a bunch of other ones. And um, that's pretty much how the Deadbeat Poets started. I got Pete John from uh, uh, the Infidels to, to be in the band and, and record and Terry Hartman an old friend of mine from and the dead voice from um, um, uh, Cleveland and we started recording that's how that happened and and the songs just started pouring out of me I think I, it was a good deal not writing anything for 13 years because then all of a sudden I had all these ideas so been writing ever since then again and having a good time with it I have more fun now now Rob than I ever did when I was younger I love going out and playing everywhere else so it's a lot of 
Well, uh, that was going to be one of my questions if you ever actually had a job or if you. <laughs> yeah. Like a, I, I, when I was younger and a teenager, I worked in a bakery. It was a horrible job lifting 100 pound sacks of flour and sugar and butter and all this off of trucks. And it was a huge bakery. But I got enough money to buy my first guitar and amps. And then um, I, I pretty much played all through the 70s, not working anywhere at Blue Ash. But then I worked at National Record Mart and when I was in Club Wow in the 80s for most of the 80s. And I became a manager there and I did really good with that. But then when I quit in 1990, I got a job as an, in, at, at an insurance company, became a man, manager there and then a district manager. And I did that for, for 20 years, retired from that in 2010. So. And then just been playing on bands since then, since 2003 when I started playing again. So I did have some jobs, but uh, I hated every minute of every job I ever had, though. So I got to admit, <laughs> I never liked it. I mean, I hated every job. I'm not well, one of these guys that believe in the, the hard work and all that. I think it's a lot of shit all the time. So, But I do it because you have to eat. So, uh, but <laughs> yeah. I never really, liked I like playing in a band a lot better. <laughs> well, what story I was going to ask you to bring up and which you've, you, you touched on a little bit was that bakery job. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it, the, the Rick, the Rickenbacker story in the book. Oh, of uh, buying the first guitar. Uh, yeah. The Epiphone. Okay, yeah, I, I Oh no, wait, you're I, right, it's Epiphone. Job. Yeah, Epiphone Casino. No, and I got uh it was nineteen sixty seven in the springtime I got a job at the bakery. And I saw this beautiful in Feral PA at Mark's Music, a red cherry epiphone casino guitar. Absolutely beautiful. It's still one of the most beautiful guitars ever made. And the Beatles were playing casinos at that time, it's Sergeant Pepper and Revolver. And, and they were, uh, they had uh, sunburst ones. So I knew my parents couldn't afford it. We, we didn't have a lot of money. And it was $330, which was a fortune then. And um, so I was making $40 a week, working 40 hours a week. I, you know, I got $1.25 an hour and I cleared a dollar. So I went to Mr. Marks, who owned the um, uh, music store. And I said, Mr. Marks, if I could, if I could sign over my paycheck to you every Every week, can I have that guitar? I'll make, I'll, you know, take me about eight payments to do it at forty, you know, dollars a week. He so he agreed to it, which I couldn't believe. So uh, I took my first couple of checks there, and as I was taking the third check again, I'm leaving the store. And he goes, "Yell, sausage, come here! You forgot something." I go, "What?" He go back. He hands me the guitar in the case. He goes, "You're a good kid. I know you'll pay it off. Have fun with it." So, oh man, I had my first good guitar. I was, I never left my sight. I took it where I went and practice and, and that's when I decided to be a professional musician. But yeah, he gave me credit as a 15 year old, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love good that guy, story. I, <laughs> I absolutely love that story. We'll, we'll talk about circumstantial evidence a little bit. Gee, I wonder where you got that title. Yeah. I mean, it's Oh, it's, it's from the song. Steve and I wrote a song called Circumstantial <laughs> Evidence. It was the flip side of Not That Way Anymore, which you opened the show with. And Billy Joe Armstrong is just recorded all out all over the world in his new album. So that's kind of cool. That was a nice thing that happened during the uh, pandemic. Yeah, but Circumstantial Evidence is pretty much about getting into trouble when you're a teenager in school and with the cops and everything like that. So I played it for Stiv and he liked it. He put some lyrics in it, too. And um, uh, when I wrote my book, I was trying to come up with titles. I came up with that one. It fit really good. So I uh, wrote the book in 2015, and it's uh, published by um, uh, High Voltage Publishing out of Australia with George Matzkoff. And it's in second printing. It's available all over the world through High Voltage and through Amazon and Barnes & Noble, Bomp, Get Hip, and, uh, along with the... Uh, uh, a lot of blue ash records too are uh oh, I'll, I'll give a little, i brought them with me brought some props okay <laughs> circumstantial <laughs> evidence look everywhere amazon <laughs> Steve Bader's soundtrack and dvd amazon danny 
Garcia's a Garcia's movie. Great movie. I'm in it. Got a lot of songs in it. Blue Ash, two two LP set. Hearts and Arrows out of Spain. A three seven inch EP with a two twenty eight songs. Billy Joe Armstrong, not that way anymore. Just covered mine and Steve's song. It's released by Warner Brothers all over the world, everywhere. So, uh, Rolling Stone, Brian Jones, The Life and Death of Brian Jones, Danny Garcia's new movie, Deadbeat Poets, have a song on it, Riding the Dog, and uh, Deadbeat Poets' Greatest Hits. Hell yeah. <laughs> Strange Tales, 2007, 2014. Got all our best stuff on here Alvin Dabney, uh, uh, Jenny Berg Hill, Staircase Stomp, all of them. Christmas time in Painesville. I love I Christmas time in Painesville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Product. <laughs> yeah, if, anything, anything you want to promote, man. Just uh, yeah, oh, that's, that's 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 a nice yeah, a lot of stuff. And look forward to the uh, new Blue Ash and the uh, new uh, Deadbeat Poets will be coming out. I'm thinking about writing a new book about um, all the bands in Northeast Ohio in the 60s and, and, and uh, 70s. So um, I have somebody that will want to put it out. So hopefully if I decide to do it, I can do it if I have enough time now. But I think I'm going to be pretty busy with if things start opening up with touring. And I do a lot of book tours and with Blue Ash and the Deadbeat Post, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. So. Well, you've got a little vlog. Like London, I gotta go back. So. Yeah, New York's still on my bucket list. I, I want to see. I, but if you come to Louisville, I get to open for you. By God. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm kidding, man. I'm not. Mexican. I'll do that. I'll definitely do that. <laughs> Before we wrap this up, sure. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I like Louisville. They, those guys took me. Uh, Van Campbell and, and the guys from the Ghetto Blasters, Justin and and, and Terry and Patrick and, and Buddha. They all took me to um, um, uh, Muhammad Ali's grave and Colonel Sanders' grave too, which was great in the same cemetery. That that was one of the highlights of the trip. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Wilson Pickett's Louisville buried there got, too. Who's is he really? Yeah, that's great. Think it I is. <laughs> yeah, that? that's like on my, huh? You said Wilson that? Pickett, right? Was yeah. Wilson Pickett's buried? Yeah, great. Yeah, <laughs> I met him during the Blue Ash days. So that's great. <laughs> of course you did. We were, I, we were recording for, in, in Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Do you have more time or are we done? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got time. We, we were recording in Philadelphia. The first Bob Mack, the guy who discovered Tommy James and the Shondells, famous Pittsburgh DJ. We played at all his clubs in Pittsburgh in 1970, and he took us to Philadelphia. And he had a song the local songwriter wrote called We'll Live Tomorrow. And it was a tribute to Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin, who had just died. So we went in and did it, and we did really good vocals on it. By the way, this single is going to come out on the on Get Hip Archive thing. It's a Blue Ash thing, Rarity. It's called We'll Live Tomorrow, and it's going to be with that with I Remember a Time. So we're working on that, too. Anyway, we're recording it, and one of the other studios next to us, it was at Sigma Sound, was the big soul studio, and Wilson Pickett was there. So he comes in to listen, and he's listening to us, and he's listening. And at the end, we're waiting, you know. The thing's over. He goes, you know what? He goes, you guys aren't bad. He goes, for white boys. <laughs> <laughs> so we all out. <laughs> and we thought it was hilarious. He was a funny guy. So that we always thought that was such a great compliment, you know, because we all loved Wilson Pickett. Anyway, that's my Wilson Pickett story. <laughs> <laughs> all right, before we start, before we wrap this up, I ask I ask every guest to tell their favorite terrible joke. Okay. My, <laughs> my, mine's, uh, let me think. Okay. Okay. You remember, um, uh, what was his name? Buddy, uh, 
oh, I can't remember his name now. It was an old uh, comedian. He was always in uh, movies. Oh, heavy set guy, buddy. Uh, no, not not Roddy Dangerfield. <laughs> oh, I can't remember his name. Buddy Hackett. Okay. Yeah, and that's it, Buddy Hackett. Johnny Carson show. He tells this joke. He goes, "What's up?" He goes, "This guy was driving in in Beverly Hills, and he's driving down Sunset Boulevard, and he and he's got." Three penguins sitting in the back seat of this convertible. And 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 the cops pull him over and he goes, What the hell is wrong with you, buddy? The cop says, You have three, three penguins. He goes, he goes, sit, sitting in, in the thing, he goes, You should take them, to, he goes, you should take them to the zoo. He goes, he goes, oh, I get, yeah, I guess you're right. So Next day, he's driving up Sunset Boulevard again, and there's three penguins in the backseat of this convertible again. This time, they've got sunglasses on, and the cop pulls them over. So, what the hell? I thought I told you to take those penguins to the zoo. The cop says to him, he goes, I did, and they liked it so much. Today, they want to go to the beach. <laughs> I always thought that was Everyone. a terrible joke, but that's my joke. Uh, that's a great, terrible <laughs> joke. <laughs> Everyone that's watching, please subscribe to Underground Opolis. Be sure I've got all I've got Deadbeat Poets links in the in the, it put up on the uh on the post. I've got Boo Ash links. So I think I've I think I've got disconnected on there. I, I was mostly trying to do the blue ash and dead beats on there. And uh I think disconnect is on there. I'm and uh, please subscribe yeah. to Underground Opolis. Follow it. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, and on Spotify. It's on every Wednesday night. Uh, will you make me a sound bite? I will. <laughs> just say, I'll just say, uh, I will say, this is Frank right now. Right yeah. now. Okay. Yeah. This is Frank Sessions. Blue Ash, the Deadbeat Poets, and Steve Bader's band. And you're listening to Rob on Underground Opolis. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you from the oh, bottom of my heart. A lot of fun. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, everybody. You All right, man. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Okay. This has been a great episode. And it, it, yeah, signing okay. off. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.